and talking to us. So first, please present yourself. Hi, I'm Lida. I come from Greece and I did my undergrad studies there. And now I am in Paris for the master and PhD. I think my first question after that is what got you uh, into physics and how was your education in Greece? So um, when I was a kid, I was a very arty kid. No one could see this STEM path that I would follow. I was doing theater and music. And then I was very into archaeology for a very long time. Wow. And my mom was like, oh, she's going to go into literature. She's going to <laughs> follow in my footsteps. But what got me uh, with archaeology was more the technical side. How do they do the dating? And uh, how do they know what is, everything is made of? So that's what kind of got me thinking, oh, maybe I actually like science and not so much the yeah. history part of it. Something clicked around high school, I think, when I started thinking, okay, what path do I need to follow to do something with science? I'm not sure which discipline I want to do. The professors are always like, oh, you should do engineering. And I think, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's where it is. But I wanted something more fundamental, but not as fundamental as mathematics. So for me, physics was a sweet spot. It was a compromise yes. between the two. That's how <laughs> I ended up there. Okay. And then finally you decided to come to France. Mm -hmm. uh, what encouraged you to make this decision? So during my bachelor in Greece, I was not quite sure what I wanted to do, but I figured out, okay, particle physics is uh, looks good. I had a professor that taught the class. It was super tough because it was theoretical. Uh, and he was like, okay, let me put you in touch with my colleague at CERN. So I had a chat with uh, Paris Fikas, who is a very big name at CERN, and he was like, okay, I think you would like experimental particle physics, but this did not exist in my university at all. Mm -hmm. So I started looking, where can I do that? I could do it in Athens, but I didn't want to do it in Athens. That's why I had left uh, to begin with. And um, oh, I forgot to say, I did my bachelor in uh, Crete. Okay. So I started looking where I can go within Europe. I didn't want to go too far to do experimental particle physics. And I already knew some friends. So I set my target as either France or Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, it seemed like Paris was the best choice because of the project that was offered to me that I really liked. Okay. So something that interests a lot of uh, many people that are interested in our channel is how did you get to do whatever you do, how you apply. So uh, could you talk a little bit about your admission process and uh, in your master's to, to in Polytechnique? Yes, so um, the admission was kind of weird because it was a new program. I very randomly stumbled upon it. I was looking at which are the best universities in Europe, in Paris, in general France, to be honest. Uh, for doing what I wanted to do, so particle physics. So I opened the Ecole Polytechnique's website and there was this PhD track program that was the second year that was happening. I'm like, okay, let's see what this is about. And the application process was very easy at the time. It was just an online form and I stated in my motivation letter what were my interests. I wanted to work for a CERN experiment and um, I wanted to do some analysis, which is on a computer, and also some hardware work. Uh, and that's all that I had to do along with the reference letters. And at the time, uh, my supervisor actually reached out to me and said, hey, we have a project to offer you. We saw your interest and we have a position with exactly the same things that you're asking for. So it was a perfect match. But that, that is just like So at the time it was very easy. Now I know that the program has advanced and there are different uh, requirements in the admission process. But at the time that was it. I ended up having this very casual interview type of meeting with both my supervisor and the person who would be a co-supervisor because there were two parts in the project. And it really felt very very casual and so we had a good vibe and i decided to to follow through with the project here did you apply elsewhere as well was just this was your <laughs> your thing i think i applied not too many i applied to five programs in total so i was very focused i knew what i wanted to do so i applied to paris 
and also to Strasbourg, which had a similar five-year program, but it was in quantum technology, so very different, but I knew it was more applied. And I knew I wanted to stay somewhere for the full five years. I didn't want to do two years here and then another three years somewhere else. And then I applied to Switzerland, uh, at the EPFL and at the University of Geneva, but they ended up being very expensive. Mm. And I had a backup, which was Sweden, because it has a super easy application process. It's very early in the year, it's in January. So for Europe, that's quite early. Mm -hmm. Most of the other ones, I think, were March or May. Um, but you put, you kind of rank your choices of universities. And then if the first one rejects you, it goes to the second one. So you actually do only one application for the whole country. And they didn't even require reference letters. So I would recommend it to anyone as a backup. And I think there I had put uh, Uppsala and Lund that had similar particle physics programs. Oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. So you said you work in high energy physics. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit what that's about? Yeah. So high energy physics is a more general term for particle physics. It includes all the fundamental interactions and properties of the particles that make up the world. Since it's a more general term, it can include uh, things like some aspects of astrophysics, some aspects of nuclear physics. It depends on the energy scale. So that's why we call it high energy physics. In our field, which is uh, colliders, it's Hadron Colliders, we are uh, at the tera electron volt scale, so we accelerate protons that collide with each other at the tera electron volt, which you can imagine is the same energy as a mosquito flying, mm -hmm. but a proton is a million, million times smaller than a mosquito, so wow. it's super fast. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's called like that. Okay. So technically, you're in the same field as someone who I don't know, studies uh, nuclear fusion reactors. Not necessarily. But you're under the yeah. same name? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Can you understand each other's work? So there are some aspects of nuclear physics that are under the high energy physics and there are low energy nuclear physics. Clear reactors are low energy mm. physics. But you have uh, accelerators that deal with hadrons, so um, maybe heavier elements. So you, they have uh, gold or uh, lead or stuff like that, and this would be high energy physics, but they still fall under the nuclear physics category. Mm, I see, I see. They do spectroscopy yeah. of uh, it, 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 it interlaps like the... Yes, okay. yes, exactly. And in 2012, uh, there was a lot of commotion about the experimental confirmation of the Higgs boson. Could you share with us what you consider to be the next big challenge for particle physics? That is very subjective. <laughs> so there was this uh, era in the 80s to early 2000s where we were discovering things. We were in the discovery era. We found a lot of new particles that either were already theorized and we had the experimental validation or we just found them randomly. Uh, and so with the start of the LHC in the 2010s, we knew what we were looking for. We were looking for the Higgs boson even before, but LHC was built to find a Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. So now we don't know what we are looking for. Okay. We are looking for new physics is what it's called. Uh, what describes the current um, state of physics is called the standard model mm. of particle physics. And we know that it is incomplete. We know that there are problems that are not explained by the standard model. So we know that we are looking for new physics, but we don't know where we will find it. So how can you look for that? This is really a question. How can you look for new things if you don't know those yeah. things? Like uh, how, how do you try to find them? Sounds like you're playing around until something breaks. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what people do. So in colliders, um, people do precision measurements. So you have a value that is uh, in the theory and you try to measure it in the experiment with more and more precision and you are trying to find a deviation from the theory. Mm. So, so far we have not found that everything overlaps with the standard okay. model, but we know that something needs to be there for us to be observing other things. There are other fields that are in particle physics, there are neutrino physics, that they are trying to measure things that have not been measured yet and maybe there we will manage to see the deviation. But yeah, it's a game of guessing. Basically, mm, okay. you're making educated guesses and you're trying to measure them. 
I am not doing that. I stay away from that. Okay. <laughs> Small tangential question yeah. about the neutrino thing. The, the, you, you said that they are trying to measure new things. Is this a matter of technological impediment or...? Uh, there are two things that we consider. There are systematics. So it has to do with how you do your experiment and there are statistical limitations, which means how much data you have. Mm. So right now uh, we have a kind of advancement in both. We have better experiments, so we have more data at the LHC. We have a new era called the high luminosity LHC that will start in five years, let's say, that we will have a ton of more data just because we are increasing how, much, how many protons that we are colliding. Uh, similar to other experiments, they are building bigger experiments so that they can collect more data. And then our tools, especially with artificial intelligence and so on, have advanced a lot. So we are lowering our systematic uncertainties by making better tools to measure what we are measuring. Nice. So what exactly do you work with at, at CERN? Can you tell us a little bit about this? Maybe how you got into the project with more details you, you yeah. mentioned already a bit. So most people working at CERN actually work for an institution that collaborates with CERN. So you don't have to be physically there in order to do this work. I personally have three very distinct roles in my experiment. First, uh, I have a role as an analysis. So I do a physics analysis, which means the data that has been taken way before, my data was taken in 2017, not by me, I analyze them. So it's a data analysis driven by a physics uh, motivation mm -hmm. and that I do on my computer, I can do it in Paris, I can do it from home, It's a, it gives you a freedom of movement which I personally like a lot. Then I have a hardware work which is working on a detector that is in the lab that I have here in Paris, we have an electronics lab and that's usually more tangible, people can understand what you are doing better because they know I'm working with cables and mm -hmm. chips and so on. And we have a lot of visits for kids to discover what we are doing, which is very nice. Now, when I am at CERN personally, because I am based in Paris, I go there to do experimental work. The experiment that I'm working for, which is called CMS, is running basically 24-7. And people need to be there all the time in order for the experiment to be able to take data. I take data for future PhD students, not for myself, basically. So when I go to CERN, I do shifts. Uh, so I'm usually on call and I am between the people that are running the experiment and the experts and they would call me and I would know who to contact in order to solve problems. Or we do what is called central shifts, which means being in the control room of the experiment and making the experiment run. So people who are starting and stopping and doing all of the work to take the data. Uh, a follow-up question about that. Do you believe that if you were for instance, in a different country, would that influence how you work, for instance, now? Definitely. The resources you have depend on the country that yeah. you're in. The analysis that we do, that is done from a computer, can be done from anywhere. Any country that is a member of CERN can have people working on the data. But the kind of things that we do require a lot of computational power. Okay. So even though you could do it from anywhere, me being here makes my life easier because my lab provides me with the computational power that I have. Mm -hmm. Now, apart from that, I think there are other things that uh, matter, like uh, having the ability to travel easily. Of course, me being near CERN is a big plus. I can be there in three hours yeah. by train. So it makes my life easier and gives me more visibility. Uh, I can travel to many other European countries for conferences quite easily and I know my lab has the resources to support me in that. Also international travel outside of Europe, uh, which is not necessarily the case for some other PhD students in countries that don't have these types of resources. So it's not necessarily going to, to obstruct your yeah. career, but it really helps to be in a country where uh, you have the support you need to do the research. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, what advice would you then give to young students who want to work in your field? And uh, especially students coming from countries that do not have the necessary infrastructure to perform 
cutting edge uh, experimental work, not necessarily in particle physics, but in, mm -hmm. in science in general, I, yeah. I would say. First, I would say just go for it. Like, it's really worth it. Even if you have limited resources, you will still be able to make an impact. And that matters to us. Then, if you have the ability to leave, because not everyone does, right? We have family responsibilities and other things that may uh, prevent us from traveling. That's okay. But if you have the ability to leave, then do it. If you don't like it, you can go back. <laughs> it's easy. But it's, uh, it's really worth it. And if uh, you think that you might not be able to, a lot of people from many countries I could also see in my program uh, from different police disciplines, you could see a selection bias. You wouldn't have uh, many people from poorer countries because they would not have been accepted yeah. because they would not have the same level of expertise that the program was expecting. Or even the perceived level of expertise. Yes, exactly. Maybe you go to a very good university, but the country that you're applying to doesn't know your university. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's very hard to be objective in things yeah. like this. Um, but the more you look into it, the more opportunities you will have. So you should try to find scholarships, you should try to find internships. Maybe it's not your dream internship, but it will get you out there and it will add to your CV yeah, and, step and make by step. everything easier. Yeah. Having good grades, unfortunately, really, really matters because if the people don't know where you're coming from, the they grades will, will tell them at least something about you. And then having good references is also important. So make connections with your professors early on so that when you are looking to get into somewhere else, uh, it will be their word that you are... A good bet. Mm. A lot of the times it's just about luck. Mm -hmm. Like I was at the correct place at the correct time, my supervisor was looking for a person to do this work and I was looking to do this work and we just must and sometimes it's just as easy as that. Mm -hmm. Well with that I would like to thank you again and thank we you. will end our interview here. It was really a great pleasure to talk to you and know a little bit more of your story. Yeah, I, I'm just so glad that we had the opportunity to interview you. I was really wanting to. Ah, by the way, me as a kid, I really wanted to be at CERN and have, and be a researcher at CERN. So you're actually living my dream. You, you're actually you're probably living many people's dreams. <laughs> it's, so. it's easier than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Well, I mean, when you're a kid, you think all of these geniuses. You can never imagine being one. Anyway, it was really great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, então, eu vou mudar um pouquinho para português. Então, pessoal, muito obrigado por terem acompanhado até aqui a nossa entrevista com a nossa querida amiga Lida. É, não deixem de deixar nos comentários qualquer pergunta que vocês ainda tenham para ela, que eu vou fazer questão de mandar e traduzir e encher um pouquinho o saco dela. É, e também, se vocês acharam que o conteúdo foi de qualidade, foi esclarecedor para vocês. Não deixem de se inscrever. E é isso aí. Até a próxima. Dá um tchauzinho. Aê! <risos> Perfeito. Eu não pensava que você ia chegar tão longe. Não há jeito. Sabe o seu valor. Sabe que isso não é o que você merece. E vá ver. Ouça os seus colegas femininos quando eles te dizem que algo está acontecendo. Acredite em eles. Porque nós ainda estamos nesse... Fight of people just not believing women. 